So I'm going to begin by asking you to all go down and introduce yourselves. I have Peter here from Google, if you don't mind starting. Um, and just obviously people know your background. If you don't mind, just briefly introducing yourself and say what you're focusing on day to day. Sure. Uh, I'm Baron. I uh, look after uh, press and communications for Google across MIA. Um, I'm a former journalist. I worked for about 20 years at the BBC and uh, at uh, ITV and Channel 4. And m before joining Google, I was editor at a show called Newsnight. Okay. Our best named panelist, Lockhart Steele. Hi there, I'm Lockhart Steele. I'm the editorial director of Vox Media. We were one of the tiny little circles on the chart that was just above our heads. Uh, Vox were the publishers of seven different brands. Uh, the Verge, which is a technology and future website. Polygon, which covers video gaming. SB Nation, which is a sports site. Curbed, which covers the world of real estate and home. Eater, the world of nightlife and restaurants. Rack, the world of shopping and retail. And Vox.com, which is our newest site, which is essentially a site that endeavors to explain the news, and the network of sites reaches about 150 million people across the globe in a given month. Great. And I'm Martin Clark, I'm the publisher of uh, Men Online. We're one of, we're the bloody great circle that wasn't on the chart, bizarrely. Um, we have over 200 million uh, UVs every month, and we're the website owned by the Daily Mail newspaper in the UK. And amazingly, the number one English language newspaper website in the, in the world, world, correct? I'm Kate Lewis. I'm the editorial director of Hearst Digital, so I run the 19 Hearst brands websites in the U.S. We have 110 million uniques a month, pretty good. And uh, prior to that, I was a print magazine editor. Okay, so I think I have a group of optimists here. You like your jobs and you smile, so I think I know the answer. But the question of whether digital content models work, give me a one-word answer, if you don't mind, and then tell me what you think is the most important development that makes you optimistic about digital content models from the last year or two. I think digital content models are persistently evolving, so what works today is great but probably won't tomorrow, and I think that's because we are all in some large measure at the whim of Google and Facebook right now, and I don't know how long that will last. Um, you know, when I think about what I am, I, I work in a, a lifestyle brand more, well, Locke and I both do, but less. there's less news in my beat. We were talking about news earlier. News for me is Taylor Swift cutting her hair, or Blake Lively having a baby, which is really important, but you know, different perhaps than what's happening in some of the other sites. And uh, so for us, um, I think storytelling is really, really important, which is like a very overused word, but how we talk about the people that we're covering, because it's a lot about people. And so when I think about that, I think about what is the role that features will play, what is the role that video will play as we move forward um, engaging audiences. Martin. Yeah, I mean, clearly we wouldn't be here if we didn't think digital content models worked, and they are, you know, clearly working for some people. Um, but there's no question that you either need uh, you either need a great deal of scale to make it pay if you've got a free model, or you need to have really exclusive proprietary information that you can charge for. And the difficulty for for many publishers is there isn't really a middle ground. You can't be a little bit successful. You've either got to be a a, a big winner or go home. And do you think it's really the top five publishers, say, in a market, or where, where, who divides the spoils ultimately in terms of scale, and how many at the top? It depends on the geography, but in most geographies, yeah. I mean, you're talking about top five, or, or, or it doesn't really become feasible without, being able to, without trying to charge for your content. But the trouble is, you know, as, if you come from a newspaper background, um, the reality is, is that there are, there are some digital giants out there that, will, that are going to be free, that always are going to be free. Um, you know, the Yahoo's, the BuzzFeed's, the AOL's, and that's who the competition is, like it or not. So you either have to step up and, and compete head to head with them. Lock. So uh, yeah, we're crazy optimists at Vox, like wildly <laughs> optimistic. Um, I mean, partly I think we have no print legacy, obviously a pure digital publisher. And I think if there's one trend that we've seen in the last year or two that really fires us up, it's this idea of new brands emerging, that we're creating brands, not just websites, but brands that a new generation of audience connect with. Uh, you know, when you think about like what might have been uh, a generation ago, like the Food Network or Bon Appetit magazine, we feel like a brand like Eater 
is that food brand for the next generation. And we work really hard on thinking about how we create content, not just for our website, which of course is important, but how we can be persistently in our audience's moment across any platform, whether that's social, whether that's emerging platforms, whether that's video or, or beyond. And Peter, you sit, you sit in a very critical spot on the internet. How have things evolved in the last couple of years from a monetization standpoint? Yeah, I'm on the question of, you know, is it working? Well, I mean, sometimes people tell us that it's not working, but I think it's, it's, it's working better all the time, and we want to be part of that conversation to make things work ever better. So, you know, th at the moment, we're sending about 10 billion clicks a month through to, to new, new sites, and that's generating $9 billion a year for publishers. And that, by the way, is, is up $2 billion from the previous year, so 2015. Nine billion clicks is generating $10 no, billion. T Ten billion clicks a month is generating, is generating nine about billion. $9 billion a year, and that's up $2 billion. So, so, so that's, that, you know, that's getting better all the time. And the way that we see it is a kind of virtuous circle where we're send, tremendous, sending tremendous traffic to websites, and then once on the websites, that's obviously a business opportunity for the, for the publishers, and we want to work with the publishers, whether it's through maps or, or YouTube or, or Hangouts or, or data journalism, to keep the people on the pages longer, and then that will feed through back into, into revenue. Do those figures just uh, take into account the search engine, or are those looking at YouTube as well? That, that's, a, that's a range, of, that's, that's for Google search and Google news and, and, and other services, 10 billion clicks a month. Sorry, can I, uh, you run those numbers past me again? You said how many clicks and it's worth how many billion? <laughs> right. Around about 10 billion clicks a month, generating, sharing with publishers about $9 billion a year. Yeah, I don't think, and hands up here who believes that. Um, <laughs> no, seriously, there's no way that if, if, if we're making the equivalent of 10 cents per Google referral, I've no problem with that, but we, but we don't. That's just not true. Well, I mean, look, I, I, these, these are our figures, and, and the, 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 you know, we, we, I can't tell you exactly uh, what each publisher is getting, but it, globally, and obviously there's an awful lot of publishers, and it's split very, many, very, very, very many ways, but uh, we're sharing around about $9 billion a year with, with publishers right, right around the world. But from you, in terms of revenue share, or, the, or in terms of the money you think we make when somebody lands from Google? In terms of the revenue share, so uh, we're, we're paying back whether it's whether it's through when you when you visit the site of the of the publisher, there's then a revenue share on the on, on the AdSense. So it's, it's AdSense partners, we're paying nine billion dollars a year to. to so it's via AdSense, not via yeah, just via normal, AdSense. not via just normal search. Via AdSense, yeah. All ah, right, okay. Which, yeah, so which is it? So it's about the service, the ad services as well yes. on the site. When you click through on the yeah, not the, paid, the paid for ads, right. yeah. Okay. Understood. Um, video is a really hot topic in the United States. People are very excited about the prospects for it. Right now in America, the cost per thousand uh, is higher than a television ad for digital news ads, which is, I think, just a temporary moment in time and will not last. Um, but do you believe that the future of advertising online is in video, and do you think that the rates will stay high? Um, Locke, do you want to start? Sure. I, I, don't think, I don't think the future is video, but I think video is very much part of the future. Um, our company, Vox, we grew up really with a lot of pure digital talent, which five or ten years ago meant that we hired a lot of bloggers. And now I think what we're looking at in the video realm is trying to find that same native digital talent, which when you look at the YouTube ecosystem, is a lot of the people I think who've really broken out on YouTube. And so one of the things we're doing now at Vox is we're trying to find that talent and work with that talent. Um, a guy like Marcus Brownlee, by the way, is this 20-year-old guy on YouTube. He has the biggest audience of basically doing consumer electronic reviews. He's now working with our website, The Verge. They're creating content together. And what we can offer him is a platform that's off of YouTube, um, where we have an audience of you know, 30 million uniques a month on The Verge. Uh, and he can bring kind of his perspective to our audience. At the same time, he can help The Verge build an audience and grow on YouTube. So again, it comes back to this idea that I was talking about earlier, which is trying to find ways to work kind of regardless of the platform. But I think in terms of building video in that way, that's the best way to think about it is, if we're gonna do it on the internet in a native way, the old models really, you can make a lot, I see a lot of beautiful video that uh, you know, certain publishers create, very good looking stuff, but at the end of the day, you know, maybe 5,000 people actually look at it. 
So we're trying to think, how can we actually build real audience around video? And I think that's a bigger challenge than just creating video. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, there's no question video is going to be uh, a, a, an important revenue stream, but there is no one revenue stream that you can rely on as being a silver bullet. You've got to, you've got to, you've got to, you've got to win at them all. You know, video, display, tier one, tier two, yep. um, uh, native advertising, video, and you've got, you've got to be good at them all, and, and then they all stack up. Um, and do you sell them together? Is sorry? That, do you sell them together, or do you find that different advertisers are interested? You offer them interested? together, and some advertisers want them all, some advertisers want to, yeah. two out of four. That's right, yeah, exactly. You, you know, you want, but you have to be in a position to be able to offer them all. You have to be offered to be in a position to offer the, the whole package. And increasingly, we're finding um, that advertisers do want to have a bit of everything, a bit of mobile, a bit of native, a bit of video, a bit of display. And uh, to be honest, and that's, what, that, what, that's what works best, but it really depends on what they're trying to sell. And, and what their product suits. Sure. Kate, how important is video advertising for Hearst? It's, I think I agree with what they've said. I mean, I think if there was one way that worked, we would all be doing the same thing. But there isn't, there hasn't yet been something that can fully monetize the kind of digit, the kind of editorial effort that's needed in the digital space. So we put our eggs in lots of baskets and all those baskets bear some fruit. And I mean, that's sort of been our approach. I think just to what Locke was saying before about hiring native digital talent for video, one of the things that's been interesting for me coming from a strong print background is m most of the people that I work with are words people and pictures people and not moving image people. And I think that's one of the exciting opportunities here is a kind of, it's a, a mesh up of two cultures, right? That people that have been used to, um, you know, engaging people with just words, and now we're bringing in these people that engage people with moving pictures and, and seeing those ideas, and I think that will kind of up the game of the YouTube creator and change the game of the traditional news writer or the traditional journalist in a way that, I, I don't know if this is happening in your organization, but it's one of the things when you talk about optimism that I think is really interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, editors have a lot of good ideas, but don't know how to execute on video. Absolutely. Yeah. No, and um, Jim from Vox is very optimistic in saying that bi about building a different type of media organization, so kind of more Silicon Valley than traditional newspaper. Um, how much has that proven true at your organization? It's, it could be hype. It could be real. Well, yeah, that's, that's Jim Van Koff. That's my CEO, who I will not sit here on stage and contradict. <laughs> No, I think Vox's approach, um, and I think similar to, to, the, to the other publishers that are up here, but you know, again, like we're being purely digital, we took a platform approach of really saying we need to build a product-based culture, which is our publishing platform, which is called Chorus, and the idea is to give the creators, whether in fact they are writers or whether they're video creators or you know, whatever medium doesn't even exist yet, give them the best possible tools to do their job and create a platform where they can put their work in front of a giant audience. And like I said, I think Jim's vision for Vox, and this is the vision that you know, I'm helping to execute every day, is this idea that we can build the next generation of media brands. And I think that when you think about the way that brands stick in people's minds and, and kind of, you, you end up self-identifying with the brands that you connect with, that's what we're trying to grow at Vox, and I think that's really the source of Jim's and, and, and my optimism. The uh, question is whether you can really survive by advertising and digital content revenues alone. And so we have two people on stage here who's, who, whose media firms are owned by larger parent companies. Um, Hearst, in the case your magazine properties are cross-subsidized by Stake and ESPN and others. Um, Mail Online is an incredibly sexy, consumer-facing business, but behind the curtain are a lot of risk analytics businesses and B2B businesses. Um, can media companies really survive and thrive without the cross-subsidies of other media properties or other sectors? Well, we, we have to. I mean, we're not, we, we have to make a profit. And um, in the long run, we're not going to be cross-subsidized by anybody. Um, so the fact that we're owned by a, you know, a traditional company is neither here nor there. And the cost of getting us this far has been relatively low. But places like you know, Vox and BuzzFeed, they're back, they're, they've, been, they've been backed by money. They didn't just start making money from day one. So um, I, don't think, I don't think there's any real difference there. Um, obviously, there are some organizations who are cross-subsidized by more populist um, outfits, but I think it's a big challenge for, um, say, more upmarket websites. The, you know, the, 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 some of the new entrants who are trying to do long-form journalism on a mass scale. 
that is a challenge because traditionally, um, long form, if you like, upmarket, um, serious journalism has always been one way or the other cross subsidised. Um, whether it be the BBC being subsidised by the licence pay or the Times being subsidised uh, by the Sun in the UK. Um, uh, so it's, it's, it, that's a challenge, I think. I think, you, you know, we, we, we took the view that if you wanted to be successful and you wanted to have scale, you had to be a very broad church. So you had to um, uh, appeal to a very broad audience, which is, which is what we do. I think trying to sort of take niche content and somehow get a broad audience for it is a real challenge. We've been talking a lot. Did you want to take that one on? I, I agree. Okay. <laughs> yeah, what he said. <laughs> We've been talking about the importance of scale. What is in people, what is in media organizations' power to help generate hits? So um, presentation of headlines, Mail Online has given that a lot of thought and does that in a very unique way with the long headlines. Um, what else can be done to kind of be at the top of either Google News results, results or search results? Um, and how much time do you spend thinking about that? Kate, do you mind? I mean, we spend, so for us, the effort has been largely in social, so using headlines, et cetera, to, and social promotion to drive stories. Um, and I think we spend an extraordinary amount of time on it. Um, it's funny because you talked a little bit about niche, and in some ways, we are pursuing a niche audience. Our biggest site is Cosmo, and it is for millennial women uniquely. I don't know how niche you would say that is, since that's probably, you know, it's 50% of the millennials. Um, so, you know, but that is something that we spend a lot of time on, I think, especially because we come to it, we have brands that have a real history and trajectory of what the expectation is from that brand. So thinking about how you translate that voice to a digital audience is incredibly important to us. So. We Could also, you give an example? Like, so how has that played out ultimately? Could you give an example of how you've approached something differently? I mean, I think you know one of the things that we have had to get away from is what the expectation of is in print. Print is such a carefully curated, um, elegantly executed product, and we don't have that luxury because you know, like on Cosmo, we're publishing 50 stories a day, so. Um, that and, and also because we're working towards you know mostly a Facebook audience, we're in competition with um, much more friendly, less experty sounding voices. So I think when you read Cosmo on Facebook or just Cosmo in general, what you see is somebody who feels like a super funny, really inclusive friend, you know, and that's just not how print magazines have traditionally sounded. They're um, they can be super funny and they can be friendly, but that's not the whole MO there. And it really is with us. So that's the kind of way that we belabor, I think, um, that headline writing and social promotion for our stuff. Yeah, I mean, the chat, I think one of the, and this, this is true, so Ezra Klein, who's a journalist who started our newest website, Vox.com, he had a great insight um, before he started our site. He said, you know, if you look at so many of the stories that we create every day on the internet, even for those of us who are pure digital publishers, you could take that story off the internet and run it in a newspaper tomorrow morning and it probably could run almost without any changes. That in a sense, as journalists, we're all still writing for a medium that we're not exactly writing for anymore. So we're still all writing newspaper stories even though we're in the digital space. So one of the things that Ezra has tried to do at Vox.com is say, what would it look like if the journalist's job was not just to write a series of news stories, but to create a persistent news resource that would be updated as often as the story called for. And so what we ended up creating for Vox.com is this concept that we call card stacks. And the idea of a card stack is that you take a major story and the journalist's responsibility is not just to write these news stories, but to keep that card stack about the news story updated so that if you want to go and get up to speed on a particular story, that's a great resource to do it. And it's trying to break with this idea of like, what does it mean to be a journalist in this century? And I think like, we're still only scratching the surface of the way that this new medium can create entirely new ways of storytelling. Yeah, I mean, we had the, the, the story of the it was New York Times style guide where they, they didn't use the name of the, of the individual in the, in the headline. They, were, they, were, they would always say uh, New Jersey governor rather than Chris Christie. So when Chris Christie ran into his problems not so long ago, everybody was searching for Chris Christie, but it wasn't, it, it wasn't surfacing. I'll be honest. We're a bit old-fashioned. I mean, we do put some time. We do put some time into to search um, uh, headline, thinking about the search element of the headline, and also the social element of the headline. But we really spend most of our time figuring what our people who are landing on the homepage are going to click. 
So we, that's why our headlines are long, is because we, we figured out that the longer, the more information we put in a headline that's on our homepage, the more people would actually click it. Um, which is why we get, I think in the UK, we get 60% of our visits on our homepage. In the US, it's 40%. In Australia, it's 40%. I mean, globally as well. That's huge. I mean, that, that's amazing. Yeah. Right? But, but it, and, and they're a valuable audience because they click 10 times as many stories, stay 10 times as long. And, you know, if anything awful happened to Google, I mean, God forbid, um, um, we'd still have a business um, or Facebook. Um, and it feels like, to me, a more robust business. Um, having said that, you know, I would agree with, um, with Lockhart. I sometimes I do get frustrated as an old newspaper guy even that I feel that you know if, if we could if we had the time to sit down and really you know deconstruct how we do stories and how we should do stories I mean we've changed an awful lot of, the, of our work practices from 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 when we were a newspaper in terms of how we publish now often we publish now often we update but sometimes I think there are still things we do just because we used to be a newspaper and because that's the way everyone's always done it that we don't need to do anymore um, and uh, it would, I think it would be exciting to, to experiment some different forms of storytelling. And I think that's where that comes back to the point you made about video, mm -hmm. is you're right, people like me don't come from a video background, and very few people you know, in, in, in story publishing, I think, on the internet do come from a video background. But actually, that's not necessarily a bad thing, because the one thing we discovered that doesn't work is, the, is, the, is doing video the way TV historically has done it, because right. it's too slow. You know, and people just haven't got the patience to sit there through a bunch of dumb two-way questions and, and all that kind of pantomime that television does as a matter of course on the TV news. So the fact that we don't necessarily know much about video right. may end up being a, a, a benefit further down the line, I think, because we'll just, I think we'll all try to do new things and, um, you know, with the uh, benefit of supreme ignorance. <laughs> and some of them will work. Yeah. I mean, there was that period where, where the, the papers tried to ape television, but they didn't as much want to do it. And it, so it looked like cheap yeah. television on the web, which was not very successful. <laughs> yes. One thing I would say about the way that, that Vox and Mail Online cover news, though that feels very different to me as a consumer, is that there is tons of, there are tons of visual cues in digital presentation that there isn't in newspaper. And I think that's another, you know, everyone talks about snackable content and it's true, like we need to break up the gray to keep our readers sustained as they're reading. Um, but I think that's something that I've been impress impressed on in Vox particularly is the use of the infographic and all that. And you guys just, you layer in pictures throughout. Mm -hmm. And that I think is really, really different. There, it's just a whole, like you're really obsessing about because they're not, they're not seeing the whole breadth of the story in one swoop the way they do on paper, so you're obsessing about how you, you know, persist in getting them to scroll, and I think that's, it's almost like the precursor to video. Like, what is the next screen? What is the next frame? What is the next thing? And I think we're, we're already making that transition even in the way we present, you know, text and, and pictures together and use of infographics and stuff like that. No, but Martin, you mentioned um, trying to rethink the way things have been done and not necessarily approach them as a print newspaper did. I think that this past year, 2014, was really interesting in the public airing um, of the New York Times Innovation Report, where it was ex an extremely public soul searching, ultimately, about the way that news uh, is approached um, and basically needing to go back to the drawing board for digital content and how, how it's conceived of, commissioned, and posted. I thought it was very interesting to see uh, a media organization discuss this internally and then see that leaked too. Um, a question for you, Peter. Uh, Google News has been a very important source of traffic, increasingly less so because of the role of social. But in an app world, how important is Google News, do you think? Because now people are navigating their way to news directly through apps. Do you think Google risks being... Yeah hurt by that trend. Well, I'm not sure about being, being hurt, but I think, you know, there's, there's a whole range of different things that, that, that we're trying with, with publishers. And as you say, I mean, the, the, the move to mobile in particular means that people are, uh, are going straight to apps, and that's obviously a big challenge for the entire ecosystem. So the way, the way that we view it is that we are working with publishers right across the, the range. So you know, the, I suppose the ad-supported model is now what you would call the traditional model, but increasingly we, we've got Newsstand, for example, which is you've got more than 2,000 publishers who are putting their content uh, onto, onto Newsstand, particularly good for, for tablets and, and, and mobile, and then, of course, working with publishers on, on apps. So um, you know, we've put a lot of effort into working with, with, with publishers, both to help surface and promote their apps, and then to help those to, to monetize better. Um, but in more general terms, you know, I see Jeff there in the front row. You know, we, we, we had a, a session at, uh, at Newsgeist in Arizona just before Christmas, uh, and one of the sessions there was, it was entitled, you know, What could, do, could Google Do for News? 
Um, and that's really something that we're very, very keen to explore right across the, the board and to, to get into very intensive conversations with, with publishers and work right across the range to see, you know, we, we don't know what the answers are yet, we don't know what, the, what the, the best models are, but there may well be answers out there that we haven't uncovered yet. So there's a lot of experimentation going on. So for example, around, uh, around supporting publishing without, without advertising, for example, one, one area is something called contributor, where we're actually, when you go to the page of, of the publisher, you can actually contribute to that publisher rather than see adverts. Uh, another way is... And the contribute by taking a survey or... Or, or, or consumer surveys, yeah. So there's, there's two, two models we're playing around with at the moment. One, one which is, is contributor, where you actually make a contribution to, to the site. So we're working, for example, with experimenting with the onion on, on that model. Another possible model is, is consumer surveys, which the FT, for example, are doing, where you go to the page and then... And that's, that's ads and additional revenue coming from consumer surveys, where you would click on, on a couple, and, answer a couple of questions. And who retains that data from the survey? Is it, is it the that, FT the, who gets it, or is it Google the, it, who it, it's gets the, it? It's the market researchers who... So, so a market research company would, would, would pay to have a, a little survey done on that page, and then that goes through to the market researcher. Well, I just, I, you know, given that I'm here in Europe, I just want to say, to be clear, we love being in Google News, and <laughs> I gather that's good, somewhat good controversial. Um, but I think from the point of view of, like, publishers like us, the idea is, like, let's be everywhere we can be to get audience, and I think... Uh, the idea that that's controversial to me, I, I find hilarious. Well, no, I mean, look, obviously we've, we've had some interesting st stories in, with Google News in, uh, in, in Europe in recent times. But yes, I mean, look, if you look at the case in Spain, where unfortunately we, we had to shut down Google yeah. News because the law, it, the law meant that we, that we had to pay publishers, and publishers couldn't even decide to opt out and, and have their content appear in Google News without being paid. But you know, many other publishers fought that very hard because they saw the tremendous value that, yeah. that being in Google News uh, brought them. And we had a similar case in, in, in Germany where uh, you know, we, we, we asked for the consent of, of publishers to appear in Google News. And of course, 99 point something percent of publishers came, came back into Google News because they, they see the value of it. It's, it's an interesting group here because I think I'm the lone contingent for a paid model online up here. Um, Kate, why, as the economist, because we right. really strongly believe in a paywall and trying to push a digital subscription or print subscription. Mm -hmm. um, why did Hearst decide not to do that with its magazine properties? Um, I think that, you know, we had, originally our websites were really venues for us to be able to sell subs to print as is true for many of the print companies, and I think that we felt like there was an opportunity to create a real digital business that would, you know, it's not that we don't encourage buying subscriptions on our sites, there's certainly a subscribe button, but that fundamentally there was more to be done with ad revenue there. And there's, you know, some of our brands do play with paid models, but I think the truth is the people believe the content is free online. And so the question for us is not how to try and convince the people otherwise, but to figure out how to convince advertisers that what we are publishing is worth buying. So that's been our approach. Um, and have you seen evidence of cannibalization or had that happened before you launched the new, what do you the mean? new website? So have you seen evidence that the free content has cannibalized subscriptions or had that already happened? No, that's, no I don't think that's, I mean, I think, you know, if to the extent that print is losing ground, that has more to do with a cultural shift to online con consumption, it's not specific to our brands. And in fact, I think our the subscriber levels at our brands remain incredibly high. I think the thing that has been jeopardized over time is newsstand. Um, but you know, we still have, re you know, consistently strong performance on subscription across all the brands, and still newsstand sales as well on many of them. I mean, Cosmo is the most powerful women's brand in the world. Blah blah blah. And that's true. Uh, social, social media, really important trend in the last couple of years that's tr totally changed the character of your traffic and where it's coming from. But it strikes me as really a mixed blessing because the amount of time that people spend on your sites is about half if they come from social media because they, it's, Facebook makes it so easy to basically click back in. Is there anything that publishers can do to fight back? against that trend, or is that just the, a new structure to the internet and nothing can be done? So I was thinking about home pages and news apps, right? You know, one of the things, it's interesting because our brands have such like credibility and longevity, but our consumer, which is primarily female, is not 
is not a homepage goer, they're not an app user, and in fact, I would even contest that news apps are making a real impact. I think if you look at the top performing apps, they're just not there. Um, and so for us, social is just essential because it's where our girl is. And so whether or not you, you know, whether or not, I mean, we certainly will work to, for, to ways to get her to just organically come to our sites, but the truth of the matter is like, that is where she lives, and we need to go join her there. And I think that was, um, one of the real revelations when we came in and kind of reimagined how Hearst Digital would work and to get away from that subscriber model was like, and, and online you don't have the luxury of like, you know, compelling your audience to you. You have to go to your audience. You have to speak what they're speaking and do what they're doing. And that's. What I, I have to say, I disagree with. I disagree with that really violently. And I think okay. anyone. Oh, good. I think anyone. Who, any, anyone who. Anyone who adopts that. Oh, we've got to. We've got to chase the, the audience here. We've got to chase the audience there, as their business model is really, really doomed. Because if people aren't visiting you directly, if they're not visiting your app, if they're not visiting your homepage. You don't have a brand. You haven't built a brand. You may have built a brand in the media business. You may have built a brand in the advertising world, but you have not built a brand with consumers because they're not taking the time to visit you. Um, and I, I think the idea that women won't visit a homepage, I, I don't buy that at all. I mean, we have, a, we have a quite a, a heavy female uh, bias amongst our direct uh, app and homepage visitors, and millions of women visit us every what's, day, and, and, the, and, and that number goes up every week. What's the age of your woman? Uh, our average, they're in their 30s. They're right. in their 30s, but I know that's an average. Right. But, but there are many, many younger, and we know that uh, we have as many uh, young women addicted to us as older women. Mm -hmm. And the idea that we're just going to throw our hands up and say, well, you know, readers aren't going to visit us directly, and unless they come to us via Facebook or Google or whatever, we don't have a business, then I think we're, uh, we're screwed. Surely well, you, I'm not because, you don't, because you will not have a brand that in the long run the readers will even connect to because the people come to you via Facebook and most of them won't even realize where they've gone. But they've I read think, the piece, they've gone back to Facebook, and you, if somebody you said to them afterwards, oh, well, who, did you enjoy that piece and, and who published it, they wouldn't have the first clue because they just looked at the pictures, read the words, and then they're gone. So, you so I, I disagree with that. I mean, I don't, I'm not suggesting you try and get rid of your homepage traffic. Obviously, you shouldn't do that. I think you but want a, lot a robust... A lot of publishers are just, have just given up on their homepage. I mean, the New York Times published that report last year in which they revealed that they'd lost half their homepage traffic in two years. And at no point did they say, what the hell are we going to do about this? They just said, oh, well, that's life, you know? Sure, um, you, we have to become more social. Well, and yeah. I think the broke the news. Growth is in everything, right? So you, we had a robust homepage group. And now we are growing it in social. I think for us, the next frontier will be newsletters, which is a deeply committed, um, branded group of people that come to you. And if you look newsletters at like refinery, I would, Newsletters I would agree with. And I'm not saying social, you shouldn't try and grow your social right. traffic. We spend a lot of time growing our social traffic. Right. But if you can only grow your social traffic right. without growing a homepage or, or app audience as well, then in the long run, you don't Although have I think a very apps robust have business. Proven to not. Sorry. The app thing is, I think, incredibly challenging. Like, I don't think a lot. I think of on, are I think on tablets, yes, yeah, apps are, apps are a, are a waste of time. But on mobile, apps definitely work. I mean, we get over a million people a day uh, through our uh, iPhone and Android mobile phone apps. Right. But I agree on tablet, it's all about browser. And Kate, yeah. why do you find that apps aren't working? I just, I don't, I don't see a lot of consumption of them. And if I look at what my audience is doing, it's not really where they are. I use them myself. Um, and, and sorry, this is your mobile audience, though? Yes. And Which our just, audience is 50% mobile, I mean. Yeah, so they're just coming through a, a browser or links. Yeah, they're coming to mobile. So, that's our, I mean, that's our strategy, too. We actually also don't do an app strategy. It's, you know, completely responsive design that looks as right. good on a tablet or a phone as it does on, you know, your desktop. Right. But I think standalone news apps, you know, in our experience, build a very small audience. Right. Well, as I say, I don't think a million a day is for a small audience, and that's you're what we get. So, you're, so you're, just, you're just chasing audience wherever you can find it? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but did you God, say that was you found me out. <laughs> but but you mean, just the point is you are, you are doing both, that. aren't you? Sorry? You, 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 want, you want people to come through the front door of the mail, and... and, and I prefer... And, I would pre look, don't get me wrong. People who visit via Facebook and Google, they're really yeah, they're, they're welcome, script. because that's how you grow. That's how, you, that's how so people it's discover not, your It's not one or the other. It's both. They discover yeah. it by accident, randomly, and then hopefully once they visit you a few times, they'll come directly. So I don't see them as second-class citizens or anything like that. But clearly, 
you know, people who visit us directly have, have longer engagement times, they have a higher frequency of visits, and so they're, they're a more valuable consumer to me than somebody who visits once a month via, by accident via Facebook. I will say and that a good, I don't a good think example is, is, is Espresso on, on The Economist, you, where you're getting you know, one, one free story a day, and if you want five free story, right. five, five stories a day, you've got to start paying for it. Well, and actually, we do, a, yeah, we do a teaser for a few, three, three months or so, and then yeah. you have to sign and up. And then you, you hope that, that people exactly. then get the habit and say, well, look, I like these stories every day. I want to, I want to get the, the full yeah. Economist experience and then sign up for a subscription or, or whatever. So, so I, one more thing just about Facebook is that I don't think those consumers are accidental. I think that, you know, we have millions of fans on Facebook who have opted in to receive messaging from us much as you would in a newsletter situation. And so they have requested us to be a part of their feed. They feel, and in fact, they've publicly declared an allegiance to our brand by saying, you know, I follow whatever. Yeah. And so I wouldn't call those accidental. No, those, those people aren't accidental, although you don't know how many people that you're, they're following. So you don't know how many people are content is appearing in their, uh, in their news feed and you don't know whether when they, when they go down through their feed and they click your content whether they were really thinking, oh yeah, I want to visit hers or Cosmo or whatever, right. or whether it's just like, you know, in the inks amongst the thousands of stories. But I think that whole thing of... And they just click the one that they hear. I agree with that. But I think the, the level of self-expression as an affiliation with a brand is very important. Like, you never, ever post something on Facebook that you think makes you look crappy. So I think just the mere notion that they've said to themselves, I, I am publicly going to declare my love and loyalty to this brand, and then when it comes up in my feed, I'm going to click it, and that feels like a comfortable place for me. I think it means something more than, I would say, in search, when you might type in chocolate cake, get good housekeeping, think, oh, I trust good housekeeping, but have no particular affiliation with it. I think the identification and the consumer we get from social is much more devout. They return often. They spend a lot of time with us. I think that, you know, and that time may be in smaller bits than you've described, but it's consistent and they're, they're loyal. One last, one last question from me, and then I'm going to open it up to the audience. I think we'll have time for one. Um, I'm curious, so this revealed an example where there's kind of two house views. I'm wondering if you could share an example where there's not necessarily consensus internally about the proper business direction to go in, whether there are certain flashpoints or decisions that you're in the process of making where you're not sure which way to go. And I'll give an example, which we've ultimately decided, but The Economist, for the first time in its history, basically launched a new product. We went for a daily app, which we had never had before. Um, the concern was whether you would end up losing your readers by introducing a lower price point for a lighter offering, and we decided that we would go. It's called Economist Espresso. We would go ahead and release it, um, and that we were catering to a different set of readers, and we found that to be true. It's younger and more international. Um, but that's one where we resolved it. Are there examples of active live debates internally at your organizations that you could share on this stage? Well, this is not necessarily active live debate, but one of the things we talked about in the beginning was how we all pursue different ad models, right? So is it video, is it native, is it programmatic, whatever it is, how do we sell on the site? And I would say that our pursuit of audience is similar to that. We will pursue homepage, we will pursue social, we will pursue newsletter and app. And so I think one of the optimistic and yet challenging things about being in this particular industry right now is that there isn't a clear path, right? There isn't one way that works, there isn't one way to attract audience and it's foolhardy as Martin suggested, to just try and get them one way. So I think that is the challenge now, is how do you do 16 things at once to try and gain that audience? And so that, I would say, if there are pressures within us, is like, what are we most focused on now? What, is, what do we think is the most, because you can't do all these things all at once. You can't create apps for every brand that I have. You can't create a newsletter system for every brand that I have. You can't, you know, and so how do we sort of parse resources? Because all of them seem like opportunities. Yeah, I mean, for us, I think our debate is around our platform. We built this incredible platform, I said, called Chorus, and the question for us right now is, how open a platform should this be? Do we want to open it up to other users, to bloggers, uh, even to advertisers, I think? And, and so just figuring out how to take the tools you've developed and make them available to a larger group of people for us right now is, uh, we're wrestling with it daily. And is there a debate about whether you should make them available to advertisers? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's something we literally talk about every day right now. Martin, anything? We don't have any disagreements at the Daily Mail about that, anything. <laughs> um, I think uh, uh, probably the reason, and genuinely, we, 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 there aren't many big internal debates we're having at the moment, because I think the thing we've, we've learned is that there is no one answer. 
I think for a long time everyone thought, okay, native's going to be the answer, or video's going to be the answer, or mobile's going to be the answer, and you've got to do, you know, th these, this is your absolute priority. And I think what we've realized now is there aren't any silver bullets, there aren't any easy answer. You just have to graft away really hard at all of them. You know, your homepage traffic, your social traffic, your search traffic, your mobile traffic, all the different types of, uh, of revenue streams that, 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 we're all, that we're all dipping into. And uh, it, it, it is, so it's never a question of, well, are we going to do this or that? The answer is always, well, we've got to do them both. And we've got to do them as, 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 and as, as hard, well as we can. Yeah, I mean, the bit I would point to, point to is actually the, the BBC, you know, which, which has the, the eye player, its own player, which is fantastic. And for many years, they resisted YouTube because they wanted people to come in the, the front door as for curated BBC experience. But if you look, for example, at Radio 1, uh, pop, the pop music station, they have embraced every platform going and very, very uh, enthusiastically embraced YouTube. And they've now got about two million subscribers on, on YouTube, the biggest radio station in the world. But that doesn't mean they're not using the material on the, on the BBC's own iPlayer as well. They're doing both at the same time, but reaching a huge audience by embracing YouTube. The debate I would have thought was happening at Google was whether paid channels is a good idea or not on YouTube. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> any, any color to that? From, from whose point of view? From, from YouTube's point of view. It's a good idea. I think. Is it? To how are the user numbers and subscribers? I'm not, I'm not going to talk about it just at the moment. <laughs> All right. Let's open up to questions. Is, does, is there anyone in the audience who has something? Second row right here. Yeah. If you don't mind shouting. Yeah, yeah hi. Patrick Martin. Hi, Patrick Martin from Strata Partners. I have a question about social because I... Um, I've heard recently that, uh, that Facebook and Twitter, they're changing their algorithms and that the feed is not coming through uh, for all your users, so that they're basically only just dribbling a percentage of users through to the people who opted into your feed. Is that something that, uh, that you've experienced? That's been true always, I mean, for a long time now. They, you know, you, I mean, you can do, a, you can request in your feed on Facebook that it's just reverse cron of everything, but the, the news feed is algorithmically curated. I would say that right now that's working out for media companies for the most part. So, you know, I, we feel like we're getting good access to our readers, but you know, that algorithm does change and tweak persistently and some days are better than others. I don't know if you guys feel the same. No, that's exactly right. I think like right now, Facebook has decided to sort of preface strong, good content as something people want to see in their newsfeed, which has been a great boon for all of us publishers. But it's also part of why we think a lot about never wanting to become too dependent on any one source because the reality is Mark Zuckerberg could wake up tomorrow and decide he wants exactly the opposite. And so we carefully make sure we're diversified across as many, not just social platforms, but search and other platforms as well. And do you find it w it's worth paying for to appear higher up, though? We don't, We no. don't either. <laughs> do you, Martin? Do you? God, no. Okay. <laughs> Consensus. <laughs> All right, well, thank you guys so much. I asked um, my panelists to disagree and keep it interesting, and I think you did exactly that. So thank you so much, and thank you, for you. audience, for listening. Thank you.